Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Unizor Education. Um, today we will continue talking about abstract vector spaces. We have started this in the previous lecture. Now the previous lecture was number seven and this is number eight. So in the previous lecture we have introduced basically the vector space as a linear space which has operations of addition and multiplication by a scalar. Now the scalar is usually either the real number or complex number. We mostly concentrated on real numbers. So when I, whenever I'm saying scalar, it means in this particular lecture, in probably all the cases, the real number. And vector space. Okay, now, now this lecture continues, uh, continues uh, developing certain properties of vector space and operations on elements of vector space. Now, primarily, this lecture is about introducing a new operation which can be performed on two um, vectors of the vector space. Now, we used to know that there is operation of addition and multiplication by scalar. Now, this operation is between two uh, vectors and uh, it's called scalar product or dot product. Now, um, the result uh, of the addition of two vectors is another vector. The result of um, product, scalar product of two vectors is a scalar. Now, let me go back to um, Euclidean space, which we know like two-dimensional, three-dimensional, n-dimensional space where we have defined, explicitly defined, um, the operation of that product. So if you have two vectors, let's say R vector, uh, let's consider it's three-dimensional, so R1, R2, R3, and S vector where you have S1, S2, S3. I defined uh, there uh, dot or scalar product as R1 times S1 plus R2 times S2 plus R3 times S3 which is a real number, one single real number. Again, when you're adding these two you will get another vector which has coordinates like R1 plus S1, R2 plus S2 and R3 plus S3 it's a vector, but if you are multiplying using this dot product, you will have one real number, which is the sum of the products of components. Now, from this, we have derived certain properties of uh, scalar product, like commutative, associative, etc. Now, what do we do with abstract vector space? We don't have this definition as coordinates, right? We have a completely different axiomatic definition of vector space. So, what we do with scalar product for abstract vector spaces, we do exactly the same thing as we did for addition, for example. We introduce certain operation by its properties, and the properties are exactly the same as the properties of scalar product for, let's say, two or three or n-dimensional Euclidean vectors. So, we are not proving these properties as we did in, in case of, let's say, n-dimensional vectors, where we defined the operation, explicitly defined, and then proved the properties. In case of abstract vectors, we do the other way around, basically. We, we are saying that any operation which satisfies these axioms, which are basically the properties which we have known about from the previous cases, so any operation will be basically the scalar uh, product of two vectors in abstract vector space. That's the most important distinction between how we approach uh, something which we can uh, define explicitly and something which we can define by properties. 
So it's like having a concrete object and derive the properties of this concrete object, basically looking at it and experimenting with this, or saying that, okay, any object which satisfies these properties would be the one which we are interested in. Okay? Okay, so what kind of axioms we are setting for um, abstract uh, vectors uh, if we are talking about scalar product? Okay, so let's consider that you have some vector space, abstract vector space. So, vector A and B belong to this vector space. Okay, now, the first thing to basically say about their vector product is, is a scalar. Now, same thing as with just second ago, I was talking about three-dimensional vectors and their dot product. The result, the dot product result is the real number, scalar. Same thing here. So if we have a vector space, and the vector space is usually associated with some scalar space, I called it S, which is actually, in most cases, either real numbers or complex numbers. And in our case, we are mostly talking about real numbers. So this is real numbers. And we know that we have already determined the addition of two vectors axiomatically and multiplication by a scalar. Now we're talking about multiplication of two vectors, which is called scalar product. And the scalar product result is the same scalar, which means in our case, real numbers. It might be complex numbers, but in our case, it's real numbers. Okay, so A product, dot product B, where A and B are two abstract vectors. First of all, this is some kind of a, a scalar, a real number. Okay, now about the properties. All right. So first of all, first property is that a times a is greater than or equal to zero. Again, if you remember, in case of three-dimensional case, if I multiply r1, r2, r3 by itself, that product, it will be r1 square plus r2 square plus r2 r3 square, which is definitely a non-negative number, right? And when when is it equal to zero? When all components are equal to zero, so it's a null vector. Now, null vector was already defined, by the way, in the previous lecture, as the one which, if you add to any other vector, will not change that vector. So what I'm saying is that a times a is equal to zero only when a is zero null vector. So null vector will give you zero. Any non-null non vector will not give you zero. It will be a positive number then. So that's my first axiom. Now, another axiom. A times B equals B times A. Commutative property. Again, in case of three-dimensional vectors, R1 times S1 plus R2 times S2 plus R3 times S3, obviously is commutative. We proved that whenever we were discussing n-dimensional vectors. So here, we are not proving it, we are actually postulating it. We are saying this is an axiom. It must be done. That's the rule which scalar product actually is defined. Next, if you multiply one of the vectors and then multiply scalar product. Now, this is multiplication by a scalar. Lambda times vector A. Lambda is scalar. A is vector. So it's basically you're increasing the length or decreasing the length of the, of the vector without changing direction, right? Now, if you multiply it, so what I'm saying is that's actually equivalent to multiplication of the same number of the scalar, scalar product. I should not really call it uh, associative because it's different things. Lambda is a scalar and A and B are vectors. But it looks like a, 
um, it looks like associative property. Okay, now, next, next is um, distributive property. A plus B, if you multiply by C, would be equal to A times C plus B times C. So that's a distributive property. Again, we did prove all these um, when we were talking about n-dimensional vectors. We have proven them based on the definition of uh, a scalar product in a dimensional case. Here, we do the same thing, but vice versa. We are saying, okay, if there is some operation which we could call a scalar product, it must obey these rules. Okay, now, what else? Now, what else is square root of A times A we call a magnitude or length of the vector or there is another word, norm norm of the vector they're all basically synonyms right now so sometimes I'm using magnitude, sometimes I can use the word norm, etc. okay, and also from this now this is just a definition, just a word it's not it's no longer uh, any kind of an axiom. Axiom we have finished here, right? So this would be norm. And then I also would like to introduce the distance between two vectors. Now, again, in case of 3, 4, or n-dimensional, we just have the difference between the vectors. Now, the difference, as I was saying before, now, a minus b is just a shorthand for a plus minus b, where minus b is the vector which is opposite to b, which if added to b will give no vector, right? Same thing here. Whenever I'm saying the difference, I mean addition of opposite vector, and opposite vector is obviously um, the one which uh, you can get by multiplying by minus 1, but that's already proven. Um, in the previous lecture. So whenever I'm saying a minus b and I have this norm, what I mean is uh, square root of a plus minus b times, this is the scalar product, a plus minus b. So this is a correct, basically, um, expression for the difference or distance between two vectors but this is basically kind of easier and more understandable obviously okay what else basically the major part is finished what I have just described which is a linear vector space which has been enriched if you wish by a new operation called a scalar product of two vectors resulting in some scalar, which is real number in our case. Now, whatever has been now um, defined, a vector product, linear vector product, and a scalar product of uh, uh, any two vectors in it, Called, let's call this together with some name, like you have n-dimensional space, right? So this is also has a name. Now, vector space by itself also is a name for some kind of a set with addition and multiplication by scalar. But if you will enrich it with a scalar product, it also has a name. A name is related to a very famous mathematician, Hilbert. Now, this is not yet a Hilbert space, Hilbert space. It will be if I will do something else, which I will do in a minute. But right now, let's call this a pre-Hilbert space. Pre-Hilbert. And I will tell why, why it's pre. It's almost Hilbert space. There is one more detail which is really needed. So, let me just wipe out this. And we will talk about pre-Hilbert versus Hilbert space.
Now we are talking about something which we do not really know what exactly this is. We are talking about vector spaces which can be anything. There are many different incarnations of vector space and in many of those many different incarnations we can introduce scalar product which would correspond to basically everything whatever we needed. All these axioms and rules will be really um, satisfied. However, since we don't really know what we are dealing with, we need something else to make it a complete, so to speak. And here is what I mean. Just consider some kind of an area on a, pl on, on, on a plane. Now, it has certain boundaries, right? Now, let's consider the same area but without the boundary. So only inside of this curve is the, basically, object of our research. Now, what's good and what's bad about it? Well, first of all, what's bad is that whenever you are approaching in some way, in, even infinitely, like reducing the size of the step less and less, in such a way that you're always moving, but you will never reach your border. Well, how can it be done? Well, let's say if you are, if you are a segment and you do not really have the edge, the end points, so you can have uh, half, half of the half, half of the another half, half and half and half and half. You are constantly moving, so these points are a sequence which is definitely converges to something. But is it converging to another real point which belongs to this set? Well, actually it converges to the end point, but we don't include end point into our set then it looks like we have a converging sequence which does not have a limit within the same set, which is not good. So Hilbert space is uh, different from pre-Hilbert space by this particular thing. It says that any kind of a sequence which, has, which, which is converging, obviously converging to something, it must have the limit which belongs to the same vector space. Because if it does not, it's just not nice. Let's put it this way. All right? Now, how can we define it? Well, we define it in a very simple way. There is a criterion called Cauchy criterion, another famous mathematician, Cauchy. Now, the criteria of Cauchy is, so let's say you have sequence x1, x2, etc., xm, etc., xn, etc. Infinite sequence of points or vectors within our vector space. Now, let's say that the difference between these um, uh, vectors is diminishing all the time. How, how can we define the convergence? Okay, Cauchy has defined convergence the following way that for any however small epsilon, positive epsilon, however small, there is some kind of a number n after which, let's say it's here, n, after which the difference norm, if you wish, or difference between any two numbers which are above this number n would be less than epsilon. So this is criterion called Cauchy criterion. So if this is satisfied, we are talking that sequence is converging. And the definition of the Hilbert space is, it's a pre-Hilbert space, if any kind of a, a Cauchy sequence or sequence which converges in a Cauchy sense which satisfies this condition, has the limit within that same vector space. Well, then this vector space is called Hilbert space. So we are adding, basically, the end point for any converging, in the Cauchy sense, converging sequence. Now, let me just repeat this again. So for any epsilon, however small, there is some kind of a number after which all these numbers, all these vectors, sorry, uh, are um, on a distance between themselves less than epsilon. So that's basically what it is.
for any epsilon there is some kind of a n after which I didn't specify after which m and n should be greater than n so after which the difference between any two vectors with numbers greater than n would be less than epsilon so they are very very close the smaller the epsilon, the further down we will have, obviously, this number n, but it always exists. So this is a converging definition. And if the sequence is converging in the sense of Cauchy criterion, then it must have a limit. And now we are talking about Hilbert space. So it's a pre-Hilbert space, which means scalar product on the top of linear vector space, which satisfies all the axioms plus completeness. Completeness means that any converging um, sequence of vectors must have a limit. And now I have a few very simple problems. Problem number one. If I have a, a zero vector, now I will use this um, bar on the top to signify that this is a zero vector, not zero number. Uh, times A is um, equal to uh, zero number. That will be my zero number. So this is a scalar product between no vector and any vector. Now I'm saying that this scalar uh, product should be equal to zero, number zero, real zero. Okay? How can I prove it? Okay. Now, in the previous lecture I have proven that if you will multiply zero by a, number zero by a, you will get a new vector. That's a problem which was in a previous uh, lecture. Now, I will replace this with this. So I will have 0 times a times a and that would be equal to... Now, we have this proportionality when the uh, multiplier can be actually taken out. So it will be 0 times a times a. Now this is Whatever this is, but multiply by zero, it will be zero. So that's the proof of it. Very easy, right? Second problem. Uh, if I will multiply minus a times a, I will have minus a times a. It's a very similar, actually, thing. Now, speaking about minus a, this is an opposite vector to a. But again, in the previous lecture, we have proven that minus a is the same thing as minus 1 as a multiplier times a. We have proven that this is an opposite vector to a. So now I'll just replace it here, and I will do exactly the same as in the previous case. Instead of minus a, I will put this scalar product with a. So this is a multiplication of vector by number, and this is a scalar product. And that would be, again, I can take proportionality minus 1 out, and that would be this. And that's exactly what's necessary to prove, because when you multiply something by minus 1, we are actually can put that this is equal to minus 1. These are real numbers. This is real numbers, and this is real numbers. Okay, and the third problem, which is... Uh, basically something equivalent to uh, to something which we have proven in n-dimensional case. This is a, a cauchy schwartz bunyakovsky inequality. Now, again, we have proven this based on explicit definition of scalar product for n-dimensional case. Uh, now, for abstract vectors, we have to use the axioms and prove it, right? So what am, uh, I'm actually proving? I would like to prove that scalar product square of A and B is less than or equal to norm A times norm B square. Or if you wish, let use the same thing, A times A times b times b. So a times a is a scalar product which gives me the real number. b times b is another scalar product which gives me a real number. And this is a multiplication of two real numbers. Now as you, as you remember I defined norm as square root of a times a. So I can put either norms or this one. 
Okay, how can I prove this? Okay, <coughs> here it is. Let's choose some kind of alpha, whatever the number alpha is. The alpha is a real number, well, scalar, which in our case, scalars are usually real numbers. Can be complex, but we're not talking about right now. Now, I will um, arrange the following expression. Alpha zero less than a plus alpha b scalar product a plus alpha b. Okay, now this is the same vector multiplied by itself, and we know that this is greater than or equal to zero. This is one of the first axioms which we were talking about today, right? Now, fine. Let's open up the parentheses. A times A would be A times A. Alpha B times A, that's alpha uh, B A. And there is A times alpha B, that's alpha A B. But again, we have commutative, so we can always have that this is plus 2 alpha a times b. And the third one is alpha square b times b. Okay? Now, this is for any alpha, doesn't really matter. So I will put alpha equals to ab divided by bb. Now, let me start from the beginning. Now, obviously, if a and b both are equal to zero, then it's just equal to zero, so that's okay. So we are assuming that some of the uh, some uh, either a or b not equal to zero, right? And uh, let's just assume that b is not equal to zero because if a is not equal to zero, I'll just change b and a, and we'll have the same thing. So basically, I'm assuming that b is not, b is not equal to zero, so I can divide by b times b. That's not a zero. It's a number, but not zero. It's a positive number. So what happens? Um, and let me just add a minus sign here. Okay. So I will have again a times a. Now plus 2 alpha a b. So would be minus uh, 2 a b square divided by b b. Right? And here I will have plus a b square um, uh, divided by b b square, but I have b b there, so I will have single b b here. So I still have zero less than this expression. Now, I will multiply everything by bb, and I will have uh, 0 less than or equal a a uh, minus 2 a b square and plus a b square. So I can just wipe out 2. And this is exactly what this is. So you just move a b square to the left and you will have exactly this uh, inequality of Cauchy um, Schwarz Bunikowski. It's kind of a very easy proof but again I did not use like if you remember in one of the previous lectures when I was talking about uh, this uh, Cauchy inequality in uh, n-dimensional case I was using explicitly how this uh, n-dimensional scalar product is defined. Here, I don't have how it's defined. I have only axioms which a scalar product must satisfy. And that's exactly sufficient to prove the same uh, cauchy schwarz bunikowski inequality. Okay? So that's it for today. 
Now, I suggest you to read the notes for this lecture. So you go to unizor.com, choose Math Plus and Problems course. Um, the part of the course is called Vectors. And from Vectors, you go to Vectors 08. Again, this is a continuation of the previous, which is 07. So if you didn't really watch that lecture, I suggest you to start from there, because that's where linear pr uh, vector pro pr spaces are introduced. And this is about scalar uh, product within these abstract vector spaces. So read these notes. They are very detailed. And uh, try to prove these problems yourself. I mean, there are solutions there um, in a very abbreviated form, I would say. But anyway, try to solve these problems again. Prove this inequality yourself, if you can. If not, read it in, uh, in the notes for this lecture. The website, by the way, is totally free. No uh, advertisement, no sign-in is not required, it's optional, so it's all available for everybody. So that's it for today, thank you very much, and good luck.